we'll start by uh, getting each of the experts up here to introduce themselves. So John will stick you on the spot when you start. My name is John Duvich. I'm the Java CTO and an IBM Distinguished Engineer, and I'm responsible for the IBM Java runtimes at IBM. So, and one of those is uh, OpenJ9. <laughs> Feedback generator. <laughs> Uh, my name is Mark Studley. I'm a senior software developer at IBM. I work for him um, and him. I am <laughs> um, uh, one of the project leads for Eclipse OpenJ9. I'm one of the project leads for Eclipse OMR, which is the project that OpenJ9 consumes. Um, I've been a just-in-time compiler developer for about 15 years. I currently lead the Testarossa um, compiler team at IBM. And I'm Dan Heidinga. I also work for, for John and for Steve, um, I've been involved in virtual machine development for 10 years. Can you guys hear us out there? Okay. Um, been involved in virtual machine development for 10 years at IBM. Um, all of that time involved with the J9 virtual machine code base, and I've been involved with the uh, JSR 292 and 335. Um, and both the implementation and the expert group. And we're here today to, to do a Ask Me Anything session on OpenJ9. Um, I figured I'd start with sort of three slides of um, content on OpenJ9, a couple of links, and a little bit of an overview of the project. So I'll run through that quickly. Um, so I know I said I wasn't going to. I had said I wasn't going to use the. Uh, the mic up here, but good thing it works out. Um, so OpenJ9 was created about two weeks ago, um, early September. There's the link to the GitHub there. There's a link to the web page. Um, it's licensed under the Apache EPL v2 license, and uh, sorry, the Apache v2 and the EPL v2, um, which and the secondary licenses clause there. The great thing about that is it makes it compatible. Uh, with GPL code, so it can be combined with OpenJDK. Um, if you're interested in getting a build, uh, our friends at the Adopt OpenJDK project have made uh, nightly builds available. This is a great place to go grab a binary to test out your application. And then just an overview of how the different communities fit together. Um, OpenJ9 is not a full JDK on its own. It combines with OpenJDK. So we've got OpenJDK. We take Hotspot out of it. We add Eclipse OpenJ9 and Eclipse OMR. Um, Eclipse OMR is another project that came out of the J9 code base. It's a series of language agnostic runtime components. So you could take those and do any uh, language runtime you wanted with them. And then on the other side, we'll have IBM's product, which has a small shim of IBMisms built around uh, the OpenJ9 uh, with OpenJDK. All right, so that's a couple of very quick overviews. Hopefully, uh, everybody's been able to catch either my session yesterday or Mark's session yesterday. And now I'd like to just uh, throw it open to everybody for any questions you might have. Oh, you got new mics? Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> hello. Dead and dead. <laughs> That's when I said all the smart stuff, too. Didn't hear a word of it. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. Right on. <laughs> now the singing begins. <laughs> all right, so start out. Uh, who wants to be the brave one to start out with the first question? Well, we got questions for you too. Who's tried it in this room? Who's downloaded it? <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to download it? So, so why should they download it? Because it's cool. <laughs> uh, it's well, it's our it's. It depends who you are, but um, people have been begging us to open source our J9 virtual machine for the last 15 years because it's been the IBM production JVM forever, and it's high performance, it's reliable, stable, 
It's got great features for diagnostics. Tons and tons, uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands of enterprise customers are actually using it. So it's a battle-tested JVM. So two weeks new doesn't mean it's two weeks new. It means that that's finally when we got it out to open source. So it's actually a high-performance JVM. When we've been optimizing it for new cloud workloads. So the new cloud workloads have a lot more dynamic behavior in terms of memory use and adaptability to what's happening in cloud environments as opposed to the old servers, which we still do well. The old servers just take the whole machine and run really, really well. Cloud, you have to be more um, you know, cognizant of the uh, dynamic behavior and memory adjustment and scheduling and all that stuff. So we optimize that for things like memory use. So that's why people should look at it because we've been focusing on a lot of things like size, size with comparable throughput. And um, we also have a lot of cool features, um, a GPU exploit. We have a very high end compilation, which I'll let uh, Mark talk about because he's part of the Testarossa uh, team. And there's essentially, if you can call, if you can name an optimization, we do it. And so we have, uh, you know, on any given day, the highest performance Java runtime. That's why you should try it. Um, and, I, and when I say any given day, that's because the other guys also compete. And so what we see is a really great ecosystem for us winning. Then they go, oh, no, we've got to fix ours. They win. We try. We win. And the result is you win. Anybody who uses it will see better performance over time for their Java applications. That's one of the reasons to download it. It's actually a great virtual machine, and it runs uh, you know, Java 9 today because that's the new release, but we also have it in our product as, as a production version of Java 8. So it's actually a real thing, not just a new open source project. So I would try it if I was you. I think another, another important thing to, to, to note there is that it's not just a, a, a source code dump. We're not, we didn't just take our code and dump it into an open source project um, and, you know, we're not using it. In fact, we are developing actively at that project of the two projects, right, Eclipse OMR and Eclipse OpenJ9. If you go and look at the Eclipse OMR project, which we open sourced in March 2016, there's a ton of activity there. There's more than 3,000 commits over that time period. So then there's, you know, kind of on the order of uh, uh, 20 to 40 commits happening per week in the project. So there's developers actively working in that project directly. We're doing virtually zero internal development with that um, with the, that project. We've been pulling it in on an hourly basis into our product. It's built into our Java 8 project. Uh, the one that we just released in September uh, as an update to Java 8 RSR5 has the most recent version of Eclipse uh, OpenJ9 in it. So it's still production caliber, uh, production quality, um, and and we're working directly there in Omar, and we're going to work directly there in OpenJ9. So it, there, there'll be very active projects. You'll see lots of stuff happening. Even even now, if you go and look, there are tons of issues open. There are tons of pull requests open. So I got a question. Another one: Who wants to become a VM developer? So that's the first thing you this enables. You can go and see how we built our JVM. You can learn about advanced JVM techniques. You want to become a VM developer? <laughs> well, then go download the code and start digging through it and you can learn stuff. And it's, and, and, and it's, it's you know, it, it'll take a while. There's a lot of code there. But it's, it's another example. And there's lots to learn. There's lots of garbage collectors that are in there you can learn about. There's a lot of code generation stuff you can learn about. There's a lot of other components to the VM. It's like a, a big, big piece of code. And if you want to learn about certain aspects of how Java works, or how even basic runtimes work, runtimes that manage memory and code gen and JIT, it's a great place to learn it. And if you want to influence that direction, that's another great way to do it and directly influence you know, a runtime that you can consume basically that month, right? and not wait a year or two years until Java comes out or something. It's, it's a real live thing that you can use and get. And one of the great ways to learn the code is to get involved, not only to read it, but then to, to make small improvements. You know, even if you start out with, hey, I found you know, some spelling or grammar mistakes, or hey, I found a, you know, an issue with the code formatting, or I found a, you know, a small bug here or there, open pull requests, get them in. You know, getting used to building the code, getting used to reading it and playing with it is a great way to get started to, to learn more of what's going on in the code base. 
and I think you'll find that the code base is actually a lot, it's a, quite a modular design, like the JIT is in one place, the JIT has a very modular design, the GC is in one place, you can, you can, it has a very well-defined um, interface to the rest of the components. We've tried hard to keep it uh, at a very modular design level so that it's easier for our developers to work for it, but it should also be easier for other people to start picking up the code base. And, you know, if you have questions, show up at the, show up at the, at our, at our repo and ask questions and we'll, we'll help you get started. Yeah, is the metronome garbage collector from this release? It is. It is. The source code for metronome is there. All of the GC policies are there, balanced um, for large heaps, metronome for um, very small, uh, consistent pause times, uh, Gen Con for your standard generational collector, and uh, blanking on the other one, opt throughput for. Which is just con. Yeah. <laughs> In, in general, if there's any feature that you're familiar with being in the IBM SDK, it's in Eclipse OpenJ9. Yeah, I so that includes shared classes, it includes a metronome, it includes our dynamic AOT technology. Uh, all of the adaptive compilation code is there. So we track, the question was, is there Oracle going to do their release and then sometime later we're going to do ours? And our intention is to work directly in open JDK <coughs> as much as possible. Right now we have a mirror of open JDK into our own GitHub repository just to make it easy for us to get our patches and our modifications out into the open so you can build open J9. Most of those patches are actually to the build system um, just to be able to plug our our repos and our build process into the Open JDK build process. But our intention is to work in Open JDK to be making changes there wherever possible and to be tracking that repo um, daily and hourly if possible. So the Open J9 code base. Um, our code base is intended to be a single code base that will be shared across Java 8, Java 9, 18.3, um, or Java 10, or you know whatever the next releases are. We're going to have one code base, one repo that supports all of these. Um, and then we'll have a separate extensions repo to track the open JDK for each of those. But the core VM, the core JIT, the core GC, all of that should be one stream, one version. Yeah, I, think, I think you're asking how soon after uh, an Oracle release comes out, would there be a, a matching OpenJ9? Immediately. We're tracking it in real time. So there's no, it's essentially it's a replacement JVM for the hotspot OpenJDK stack. It's just OpenJDK class libraries on OpenJ9 instead of on hotspot. So we just have a, what do we consider a better VM implementation that we replace basically as part of the, you know, our day-to-day -day development process for lots of reasons. We have a lot of features that they don't have that we need for our customers and a lot of features that are you know, very unique to, uh, to JVMs in you know, particular. So that's, you know, that's why we're doing it. Pardon me? I'm not sure I, answer, I know the question. What's the main difference between which? Oh, we, we, we named them already, uh, but we can re reiterate things like shared classes. So we take our class files and put them into a shareable area that's read-only. That means if you run multiple instances of Java, for example, in the cloud, you have a reduced footprint because essentially you're making a shared area for all your read-only code. Um, if, if that didn't, the, the simple way to think of it is there, it's like a dynamic DLL. So a DLL allows you to share object code between running processes. Because Java class files aren't convertible to DLLs that easily and statically, you don't want to do it because you have to do a lot of stuff late. We essentially create, create a DLL in memory on the fly, and that's our shared classes facility, and it can, sh it can save you a significant amount of memory. And we can put other stuff in there, code and uh, Java bytecodes and native code, and even uh, strings in some cases and other things. So uh, that's a feature that um, we have that Oracle doesn't have, and it gives us significant performance 
uh, boost in terms of footprint. And footprint's important, at least in cloud scenarios, because you're paying by the byte. So if you're paying 10 cents a gigabyte and you use twice as much, it's 20 cents instead of one, instead of 10 cents. So it's economics that are driving this investment because people who want to deploy lots of, a large volume of microservices, lots of VMs, will want to have the minimum memory use possible because you're paying typically on cloud by memory use. So that's, a, that's one of the features. We also have, uh, you know, there's a real-time garbage collector. No one else has that one, that kind of technology in their, in their uh, runtime. There's a dynamic AOT, which is a feature that caches JIT code in the shared classes cache so that for future runs are very, very fast because you don't have to JIT compile. So think of it like amortizing the cost of JIT compilation over multiple runs so you save the compilation time, but it still allows that code to be re-optimized later. So those kind of features, if, uh, if those... There's a size there. Um, oh, we have uh, we have a small footprint version that is, I believe, smaller than the OpenJDK. Um, with new Java 9, uh, I think the verdict's out at the moment because Java 9 is designed to be stripped into nothingness, and so we have a technology that allows you to strip to nothing, but the size will be approximately the same, spe specifically because the uh, the libraries are the same. So the big piece of it is the same. Uh, it's just the VM itself. I don't know if we have a size by size. We certainly have a footprint savings at runtime, but if you're asking me about the disk size, that's really about pieces you could remove so that you don't have to package them, which is a kind of a Docker use case. You want to throw away all the stuff that isn't needed and then have a smaller deployment there. Is that memory area supporting the VM? Um, uh, resource managed regions, I mean? Um, I see. So you want RTSJ support. Uh, that is not in our code base for uh, the OpenJ9. No, we didn't put that out there. Is that important to you, I assume? Yeah. Okay, because <laughs> okay, there's, there's um, uh, the resource support is still nascent, right? In there somewhere, just take that out. Don't tell me now you took it out, but... <laughs> I think we took it out. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Because yeah, that, that has to go back in eventually because there's, um, but it's not going to give you the real time thing, but it gives you isolation of memory allocation in different contexts so you can do prevent uh, two tenants from harassing each other. But it doesn't give the scope memory is what you're talking about. We, don't, that, we took that out because uh, we stopped supporting RTSJ in Java 7. No, last release was Java 7. Last release was Java 7. It was uh, for RTSJ. So is, it, so is it RTSJ that you're interested in, or is it memory management that you're interested in? What is the... RTSJ, but Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, that's a long debate we should talk after. But the uh, things like RTSJ as a workaround uh, for the fact that Java doesn't have a, a hard real-time GC. Yeah, and, not, and the schedule, yeah, it, well, the, the, pro, the, the thread spec doesn't allow you to set priorities and, and, and to find the rules for um, um, priority inversion and all the things that RTSJ then gives you, right? So, but if the spec allowed just three or four different things in thread, then you wouldn't need that, and then the scope memory is only there because there's not a real hard, real-time GC in, that they can force onto Java, into Java, like as a spec metronome is a hard real-time GC. You don't actually have to program specially to get the real-time um, because you can. Uh, you, you don't have to use scopes, which is hard, difficult to use. You just have a hard real-time GC where you can configure for memory, time, um, max memory, uh, max pause time, and utilization. utilization percentage of CPU that you want used, and you can pick two of three to, to, uh, to configure. And, and that's, that means any program can have uh, real-time behavior from the garbage collector. That doesn't give you real-time behavior in your code. That's up to the developer. You can still write code that has not. It's non-deterministic. Clearly. Yeah, and, and then of course the threading, that external threading has to be done right. And you need a mapping back to, to, the, to the OS scheduler that, that gives you a predictable thing on, portably on whatever RTOS you're on. Um, so that's part of the product that was back in Java 7, but we didn't have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, when, when you hear the word real-time, um, in industry, at least the enterprise, they don't mean real time. They just mean 
fast or something. But like they don't they don't mean hard deadline. They just mean fast and, and relatively responsive. Responsive and responsive. Yeah. Um, what, what kind of latencies are you um, interested in? Like, what do you care about? Do you care about milliseconds? Do you care about microseconds? Sub millisecond. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Regular JVM, you really do need real time schedulers. So. Yeah, well, you need to schedule it with certified hardware. So, the certified hardware um, would ensure that things like background memory scans are done as a scheduled thing as opposed to for, for DRAM refresh and stuff as a part of scheduled operations in the real time OS instead of a firmware that just interrupts you, hard blocks you for an unknown period of time. So, all of the uh, hardware we have certified to do uh, schedulable uh, DRAM refresh and other. Housekeeping, so that you wouldn't have any pauses. So it's a clearly sophisticated thing that we we used to have as a product, but um, it's very specialized. So if you want to talk later, I'd be happy to hear what else you need. But um. all right, so no questions. You're asking if there's library differences between the two JDKs. We reuse the Open JDK class libraries, um, so 99% of the code is the same. Uh, there's a very small layer of classes that the VM knows about that we replace. Um, so we replace things like JavaLang class. We replace things like JavaLang thread, um, JavaLang string, and some of the method handle related codes, uh, method handle related classes. Yeah. But the majority of the code is identical. Yeah. So the the uh, the JDK we produce out of OpenJ9 as a product is 100% compliant and certified as the IBM JDK. So it's the same platform implementation compatible. So that's that's there under the covers. Well, of course, we use libraries. We have additional libraries that add functionality. For example, RDMA support. That's so RDMA is a, a high-speed network um, protocol and uh, takes uh, offloads from CPU to the network card. And that transparently accelerates uh, NIO and NIO2, a standard library. But under the covers, we do something significantly better. If you care about that particular aspect of IO, it's just done better. So compatible has to be compatible. Otherwise, you can't have people change their code just to get on our platform. It's, uh, it's compatible. But um, it just does things differently. So. It, the JVM has always been something that you could implement independently and pick one. There's been 50 different J JVMs built over the, the course of the last 20 years for Java, 50 good ones. Um, uh, they don't all survive, of course. They for, have various reasons. And so, uh, you know, this is our production VM, and it just makes things better in a compatible way. That's the whole point of it. Yeah, there's a website you can go look. So yeah. if you start from the OpenJ9 website, um, you should be able to find links yeah. uh, and details there. And if there isn't, uh, there will be links off to some of the IBM documentation, which uh, we've been relying on until we rewrite the new documentation for OpenJ9. Yeah. And there's things there. You can go look at the performance comparisons. You can get the code, run it side by side against uh, OpenJDK, the the, you know, the the OpenJDK with hotspot version, and 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 see the differences there. Pardon me. Uh, you have the uh, you have the chart. I guess it's just go to the site if you have a Wi-Fi. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully it works. You are not connected to the internet. I couldn't get a connection in here either. Yeah. So. But if you go to this, if you go to the website, there's a set of comparisons and performance and other things that you can go do. Try the code yourself and just and just do it. Pardon me. No, no, we implement the same specification, uh, and then we are compliant to that specification. There's only one sp one specification, and we both implement the same one. That's how Java works. You implement a Java virtual machine specification, and then you also implement the uh, API, you know, the platform specification for Java 6 or 7 or 8, and together you can have a uh, JDK. Well, 
the JRE for the runtime and then the JDK is additional tools that come with it, Java C and those things. So there, it's just, it's a plug replacement for OpenJDK, just built OpenJDK with Hotspot. It's just a plug replacement for it, so you shouldn't see any real differences other than better performance and awesomeness and all the stuff that we're, we're, we're bragging about up here. Right. So the community binaries that adopt OpenJDK where are going to be compliance tested. So this is that's a community thing, which is all open source and GPL class path. So that's what you can get. And then there's a then there's our use in the products as well for our customers. But they're, those are identical. So we want to do this um, so that people can just get it and try it, uh, compare it in their world, just, just have it uh, easily available to anybody. And then if they decide to be serious and go into production. Right, if they have a you know a real use, then they can um, either up upgrade to a, a product with support if they want, or they can just just continue to use it for free or whatever. And that's pretty much how everybody does um, Java support, for example. Oracle does the same kind of thing. You can just use their Java all, all you want, but if you really need to be able to call them and get a fix on their code, you you end up buying support. And in IBM, we do the same kind of thing for so it's freely usable by anybody for any reason. And but if you have an IBM product or IBM hardware or IBM stuff with it, you get support too. So you can call us and, and shake your fist about whatever broke and uh, we'll fix it. So I don't know if that answers your question because, you know, it's, uh, but okay. Newcomers. We use the same set. Yeah, we have additional tools for uh, profiling and uh, performance monitoring and those kinds of things. In addition to the base, we have additional stuff, but the same set is there that's in OpenJDK. So JDEPs, for example, if you want to see where you're not supposed to be touching code or something like that, that's all in there. So it's the same. There's a question coming at the back somewhere. You? Yeah, I, I guess I've been using your uh, uh, Japanese version for a while now. Something like I don't have to worry about the garbage collector being changed on me or being deprecated, uh, continue on with the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as, a matter, as a matter of fact, if you move to SR5, 8SR5 is our mainline supported version, which is just a standard uh, service refresh. You're soaking in this. And you get all the great, latest, greatest updates. You get all the latest, greatest updates, too. So if you upgrade to our production version, as, as Mark said, it's coming in every hour and we update monthly. And so you'll, and all the stuff you have is still there. Okay, but yeah. Well, what, yeah, so, um, well, everyone does that, it's a little bit scary. What typically happens is they introduce a new GC, and we've done the same thing, and then we leave it in for two releases before we switch it to default, so it's been tested in production. So when we did a Gen Con, which is a generational collector in front of the concurrent collector, so concurrent is like CMS, Right, but and ours is just called con or concurrent, and gen is generational scavenger. So gen con is the combined word. When we had that, we introduced it two releases prior to making it a default. Um, but all of WebSphere had switched prior and set the command line <coughs> because it was so much better. Uh, customers were getting 25% boost just by turning it on because of the amount of garbage they were making. So we battle tested for four to five years, and then it becomes a default, um, and then. So uh, it might be, you know, um, you might be shocked, but you, you, if I'd be shocked if they took out their other collectors and just switched you, that would be kind of frightening. Um, we just switched which of the five are defaults, and we switched to the, the one that was giving the best performance across the board. Right. Yeah. Any way to force the, uh, do you mean to pick the garbage collection policy? Uh, yeah, we have an option, dash X uh, GC policy, and uh, and then you can specify, you know, which of the bal which of the garbage collector <coughs> garbage collector policies you'd like, whether it's balanced for large heaps, uh, Gen Con for most things, um, or metronome for uh, small uh, deterministic pauses. So there's command line options to pick which GC policy. 
Did you mean to force a GC policy, or did you mean to force a GC cycle to happen? To force a GC cycle to happen? No. You shouldn't do that, but. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there is, a, there is an API through the system class to do that, right? You can cause it to do a GC. But yeah. yeah, the problem with system.gc is that it used to be, in the old days, when the collector was concurrent, it would say, do a few more cycles, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, so that you wouldn't get behind. And so if you had something where you had to kick it to do that, the problem is if you have a different GC technology where forcing it isn't super, super small, like the concurrent one would just do a couple more steps, and you actually have to do a full GC cycle, right, then calling it all the time drives your performance to zero because you're just wasting your time GCing when you shouldn't. And so the API isn't rich enough to pick the right kind of thing. The right kind of thing should be, uh, you know, it's a good time to GC, and then the VM can go, no, it's not, <laughs> and ignore you, which is what, what mostly people have to do now because if you call it too often, your performance goes to zero because if you're in a tight loop calling it to GC, you're wasting your GC time. So it can't actually be spec'd right it's not actually spec right. It's just it's you know it's a hint to tell the GC to do more uh, in garbage heavy situations. But all of the VMs actually know when to GC and the, are very aggressive in trying to to drive a GC, including ours for cloud workloads. To try to keep your memory as low as possible because that actually improves your performance. Um, better cache, better uh, kindergarten essentially cooperate well with others because there's other things running. So you know share your toys, share your memory. So, so don't call it. If you have it in your thing and you think it's doing you a favor, try to take it out, and you'll see what happens. It'll be uh, it'll be better, I think. Um, the only thing that some people used to force is the system GC to get class unloading. So if you have heavy class unloading, people thought that would help. You don't need to do that. It does it. Okay, we do it right. No one else? You have a question. I know you have a question. <laughs> hey. Afterwards? Oh, man. You don't want everyone to know your secret questions? Come on. Dino, he's sitting right next to you. Go force a question. I don't know. I got, I got people in the audience who could like, t get it out of you if you want. Yeah? So who actually uses any IBM products that are based with either Open Jane or our IBM SDK or WebSphere or other things? WebSphere, okay. Uh, Liberty as well? Oh, yeah. WebSphere and Liberty? Yeah, okay. So this is part of our full open stack. We have OpenJ9 down at the, at the metal. Yes. Yeah. And actually, if, uh, yes. Yeah. It's the exact same one. We just open sourced it. And if you run the latest version of Java 8, if you're running Java 8, which I recommend, because Java 8 will be your go-to VM for the next five, six years. Java 9 is interesting for developers because they have to learn about modularity and refactor their code, and it's not a trivial thing. It may not be a trivial thing. If, you're, if you've been a purist developer, it's going to be easy. If you're using all sorts of internals and you want to refactor into modules, it'll be a longer process. Um, but then you'll also have to get all of your components that you're depending on also refactored. So it's a, it's. You know, we call it the uh, you know 32-64-bit transition. It was the same as in the old days when you had to go get 64-bit DLLs from your you know if you if you bought you know code from a provider that used to only provide 32, so you couldn't go until all your components were upgraded to modularity as well. So we see that as a developer release that developers can really get you know, sink their teeth into, see what's going to work, what isn't going to work, upgrade the open source components potentially because a lot of the um, Enterprise customers use a lot of open source, believe it or not. They, they may not know it, but they are. So those have to be upgraded before we see a broad, broad adoption of eight or nine. So we upgraded in eight, and that's what you'll be soaking in for the next eight years. Is it eight? Seven years. 2025. So, um, so that's, that's the other thing. You know, eight is stable. It's the thing that people have been doing. That's why we have the latest, this VM, which is a nine VM, running in eight. Because we know that people aren't going to be able to get to nine in all cases because of the majority of their code it may not run in the way they want to in modularity systems. Yeah? So what VM changes do you need to make to support There's a long list that Dan's going to tell you about. I was going to say, actually, it's a fairly short list. Um, sorry, John. <laughs> you, have to, you have to brag a little more. It was intense and <laughs> crazy changes. 
most of the VM changes are tracking the module state to be able to know um, when doing access checks, uh, does this module read that module? Is it allowed to see this? Is it allowed to see that package? And so it's mostly in visibility checking and in tracking the module states. Um, there's a little bit of work that had to go into um, things like JVMTI because there's new APIs for dealing with modules. There's a little bit of work around JNI for the same reason. But the module specific piece of work that you have to do for the JVM was smaller than expected. A lot of that resides actually in the class libraries. Um, we did it at the same time that it was occurring in OpenJDK, so it was quite a lot of work because it, it was tracking um, as the specification changed, so you'd implement down one path and then you'd backtrack and then you'd implement something else and backtrack. So it, it's been a lot of work to get there, but I think if you sat down now and took a look at the specification, you'd probably have a lot less work to do. It's really the, really the class libraries that needed the most munging because they have all the dependencies and they have to figure out where they were. Right? If you see the pictures that are drawn for all the connectivity in the in the class libraries, if you want to chop a big piece out, you'd be surprised what dependency calls that piece and that shouldn't, right? So you know, things are dependent, low-level stuff dependent on the windowing system. Go figure, right? Like, you know, like weird, uh, which caused the problem because the startup performance, if you have to open your AWT windowing system DLL, it adds you know, 300 milliseconds of stupidity or something to, to just open it to not use it. Right? So a modular system should be faster because you really only get what you need if it's, if it's designed well. Yes, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, so we moved this, uh, this VM is uh, an update to our Java 8 supported line, so Java 8 SR5 going forward, and then we will continue to do that. And the reason we do that is because we have such a long lifetime expected for 8 with our customers, because they will uh, probably stick on 8 for a while for a lot of their production workloads, and then they'll adopt new Java 9 features for maybe some new stuff, microservices or other things. So uh, we want a single VM for both. Um, and so, for example, if you're a mainframe customer, anyone here a mainframe customer? Like the, the best processor in the planet, the Z processor I heard. <laughs> He's going to start getting mad. <clears throat> um, uh, we've added new instructions to that, you know, designed years ago, to help garbage collection. So you have a, we have a guarded storage. It's called guarded storage, which helps you do a conditional fetch of memory. So when things move, we can actually uh, concurrently run the execution while the garbage collection is happening. So it makes generational scavenging significantly, um, have significantly less pauses as part of the, the, the pause. So just for regular workloads. So, um, and that's with, you know, sm well, a small amount of hardware support that Z guys will be really mad, but with actual hardware support that gives you, <coughs> um, so it's called guarded, <coughs> guarded storage, you can actually do a, a nicer garbage collector implementation. So. And so currency of processor is important to us. And that's why we want you know, all the processor vendors there, because then every new feature, you don't have to wait for a major upgrade, a 9, 10, 11, to get your favorite processor supported. You get a new engine in an existing form factor, and it just works, um, which gives you, you know, the best of both worlds. And one of the reasons you use Java, the latest, greatest processor exploits without changing your application, because we dynamically compile to that processor. And, and we didn't mention earlier, what processors do we support? I'll ask the question. <laughs> uh, right now, right now we have three platforms that we're supporting with the open source project. So we have Linux on x86, we have Linux on PowerPC, and we have Linux on Z on our mainframes. Um, so <coughs> that's the that's the current state of things. We've got uh, work underway right now to bring some of the other platforms that the IBM SDK runs on, like Windows and AIX and and ZOS, ZOS, sorry, for you. <laughs> We're in the US, I should say ZOS. Um, and uh, uh, we've also got some issues open at the open source project already to talk about new platforms that we haven't traditionally focused on, like uh, Mac OS and, uh, and ARM. And some people have actually been reaching out to, to help us with those platforms. And that's, you know, we're hoping that continues. Um, that's just goodness for us. Any platforms missing from that list that people think we should be including? 
Any ones we should drop on Intel? Or? <laughs> That's what we all love to do, of course, is, is now, drop something. Everyone, everyone guess where some guys work. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so uh, you mean uh, uh, Web3 replaced micro edition and custom edition products? Those things? Those? Oh, you just mean micro edition? Uh, the you mean the Java ME? Um, uh, well, J9 is a long history. It used to it started out as a as an embedded JVM, and it was exclusively used for embedded for the first few years because uh, it was small. The original the original libraries were 300k. The VM would fit in 512k, and it was a good VM for that. And that's why it's modular. You could throw away the JIT and replace it with a different, smaller JIT, and all of those things. Um, so it has the heritage. Um, there is no ME version because ME is going away. There is no ME future. ME has been uh, deprecated by Oracle because they want you to use modularity to get your smaller runtimes. And so there is no real ME anymore, and even I think embedded is, is gone, but I can't speak in detail about what Oracle's saying. I just know that there is really no ME uh, going forward. Well, actually, the ME that's going forward is specifically CLDC, which is the phone one that uh, which is uh, super small and a subset of the actual JVM. It doesn't support all the JVM features. So CLDC for the super small phones is not real. So what about the all the APIs that you have? Like the, the connections? We have uh, we have that code. Uh, we could open source it. We haven't haven't really thought through. <laughs> sure, why not? So yeah, so the, it was one of those things where you, you point out as a subset of SE, ME wasn't. It was a sub superset. So the subset plus some extra stuff. So you can't run all your ME applications on an SE runtime for some crazy reason. Um, the crazy reason is called what? Poor design. Okay. Yeah, I'm on I'm on film now for sure. So, but but it was it was just how it was organically created that you know, people needed these new APIs and you can't just uh, you know create a new platform over here and 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 uh, keep it up with some other platform. So it just didn't match. Um, so things like the connection frameworks, for example, those sh we have because those sh those can be re-implemented on standard I/O and everything. So those we should be able to do. Uh, location and others, those are really hard, end up being hardware specific anyway in some cases. They, you could do a provider that plugs in or something, but we'll look at it. We, I mean, there's the codes, there's not tons of code, but there's no, there's no reason to, to keep it ourselves. It just wasn't a priority in this list because we're focused on SE and SE9. That's right. Right, right. So there's license. The, the, there, yeah, there might be licensing and other stuff like you want a Bluetooth or something, right? From uh, from no, right, from Nokia or something. Those those APIs. But yeah, there's there's a fair number of those. Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I think that'll be an interesting thing. What happens with SE and embedded, and how, what uh, whether you'll start to see a bunch of community modules that run on base that just become base plus a bunch of very small extensions for specifically running embedded. Um, telematics, headless, that kind of thing, if you want, or uh, but we'll see. There's lots of. I think it'll. The modularity thing will open up new platform opportunities for base plus other things. You don't want all of SC for a lot of use cases. You just want ba the base language, um, and then you want your five things that enable hardware or whatever. So. But it's good to have standard APIs. So yeah. Yeah. Trouble yeah. You, you need the standards if you're going to create a platform that you want other folks to write to. So if you're going to embed, a, if you're going to use for embedded and you want to have embedded, which I, 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 get, I gather you're doing, you're going to want people to write for your platform. You're not going to want to have proprietary APIs because they won't do it anyway. Right? Yeah. Right. It will, will it? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah. It, it, there's a lot there too, and there's a lot of. Uh, it, that, you know that example shows the the speed that open source and open source projects can actually move when they're actually. 
well, if you have the money to spend, you can really move stuff fast. And that's one of the reasons we open source, that we, we have a lot of our own source. IBM is not a company that doesn't have resources, but partners with IBM could go significantly faster, which is why our micro profile in EE spaces with you know, Red Hat, Payar, and five other groups, our, our uh, partnerships here, uh, we're looking to have all the hardware vendors with us, but also all the uh, hardware extenders too, and, um, and then the cloud providers too, to configure for, you know, what I would say is customized version of the runtime in the cloud and those kinds of scenarios that maybe weren't in reach before. So, any more? I don't know how much time we have, but. 45 minutes now. Is it, any more questions? One last question. A really hard question, let's go for it. Something difficult. Who's going to now try it if you haven't tried it? Who's going to go adopt OpenJDK and download it right away? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> there. It would, it would, it would, you'd get answers quicker by downloading it and trying it than all the questions, so you should do it. Do it while you're here so the download speed's fast. <laughs> okay. So. All right, we're being told that uh, we've run out of time, so thank you everybody for coming and for asking questions, and uh, we'll be around. Uh, either find us at the booth or the IBM booth or the Eclipse booth. Uh, Mark, I think you're there later today. Yeah, 2.30 2 to 4.30, I'll be at the Eclipse booth if you have more questions about anything, or just catch me walking around. He's, he's easy to find. But... <laughs>